Well, good morning. I'd like to welcome you to another edition of Anchored in the Word, uh, Morning Reflection. And today, the passage that we're going to be looking at is Colossians chapter 2. And we're going to be reading from verses 18 down to, ver- or excuse me, from verse 8 all the way down to verse 23. If you're joining us this morning, please take your Bibles and turn to Colossians chapter 2, verses 8 through 23 for our morning reflection. I'm going to go ahead and begin reading in verse number 8, and we'll move through the passage and then uh, take some time to reflect on this. Verse 8 says this, Beware, lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit, after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And ye are complete in him, which is the head of all principalities and powers, in whom also ye are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands, and putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, buried with him in baptism, wherein also ye are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God, who hath raised him from the dead. And you being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. And having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. Let no man therefore judge you in meat, or in drink, or in respect of holy day, or of the new moon, or of the Sabbath days, which are a shadow of things to come, but the body is of Christ. Let no man beguile you of your reward in a voluntary humility and worshiping of angels, intruding into those things which he hath not seen, vainly puffed up by his fleshly mind, not beholding the head from which all the body by joints and bonds having nourished together, ministered and knit together, increaseth with the increase of God. Wherefore, if ye be dead with Christ from the rudiments of the world, why, as though living in the world, are ye subject to ordinances? Touch not, taste not, handle not, which are all to perish with the using, after the commandments and doctrines of men, which things have indeed a show of wisdom and all and in will worship and humility and neglecting of the body, not in any honor to be satisfying of the flesh. Now, when I read this passage of Scripture this morning, I tried to kind of think through the whole setting, and obviously you can see that Paul is addressing some specific kinds of false doctrines, some philosophies that he is burdened are starting to infiltrate the church, and they're starting to affect the way that these Christians are thinking. So you can see that uh, there are people that are Judaizers. They're, they're pushing the law on them. You can see that there's a Gnostic uh, 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 dynamic here where there are people that are trying to give the impression that, that the body, our fleshly body, is sinful. And yes, we live in a fallen body, but the fact that we have physical desires is not sinful. It's not sinful for me to eat food or sinful for me to take a nap when I need to do that. It's not sinful for me to exercise and take care of my body. Yet there are people that were teaching that the body's evil. Uh, there are people that were claiming that they'd had these extreme, uh, intense spiritual experiences and they, they took a lot of pride in those experiences. And Paul was very concerned that this asceticism, this law-keeping focus, uh, this emphasis on spiritual experience was something that was really going to drag down these Colossian and Laodicean Christians. And they would not grow like they should and like they could because they were being captured by these philosophies. And so the summary that I think we could, we could write down for this passage is that we should not let people who boast of remarkable spiritual experiences and live lives of extreme self-denial convince us to follow their ways, abandoning the only source of true spiritual growth. I think that's really what Paul was trying to communicate to those Christians and really what we should take in the big picture of this study. So this morning, let's look at a couple of key phrases and see how they're connected as we look at that main point of not getting captured by the philosophies of men that ultimately cause us to abandon uh, our confidence and our source of strength in Christ. The first observation uh, that we find in this passage is that there's a statement at the very beginning that really summarizes the whole point of the passage. He says in verse 8, beware lest any man spoil you. And the idea is, 
They take you captive, similar to what happened when people would go out to war and there was a battle, and then the conqueror would take the spoils with them. He said, don't let people capture you and take you spoil through philosophy, through vain deceit, after the traditions of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. That statement is really the summary, in many ways, of this entire thought. And the second observation we have is this. The next two statements are really the reason why he makes that statement. And the second of those two statements, he really is going to develop a bit so that we'll understand it fully. The first statement that he makes is this. For, verse 9, here's the reason. Because in him, in Christ, dwelleth the fullness of of the Godhead bodily. In fact, this is a really interesting statement. He uses the present tense here, and he's basically saying, today, right now, the Lord Jesus Christ possesses in its fullness everything that there is to call him God. And what's interesting is we could say this, at a point in time, the Lord Jesus Christ, the second person of the Godhead, took on humanity. It says in John 1 that the word became flesh And he dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory. The glory is of the only begotten of the Father. So the Lord Jesus Christ, the second person of the triune God, today and forever possesses not only everything that makes him God, but also full humanity. He is God in flesh. And so the first reason that we shouldn't be captured by this is because the Lord Jesus Christ, he is God in the flesh. The second reason he gives is in verse 10. He says, and you are complete in him. The idea is that you are completely full of certain qualities that God has placed in you, and it's through Christ. He says Christ is the head of all principalities and powers. What's interesting is in this passage, one of the things that he's going to point out is that some of these false philosophies and views that were being pressed on these Christians involved worshiping angels and spiritual experiences. And basically what Paul's saying is Christ is the head, he's the authority of all those things. So you're getting focused on angels, on demons, on spiritual experiences. You need to focus on Christ. He is he is the head of everything that exists. He then goes on, here's a third observation that we have. He then answers how we're complete in Christ. What are the things that he has filled us up in? And he lists quite a few. The first thing is found in verse 11. He says, in whom also ye are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands. Now, one of the main uh, problems that was going on in the church was the influence of Judaizers. People who were trying to force uh, Gentile Christians to uh, observe the Mosaic law and the old covenant. And one of, the, one of the big things that was being encouraged was that people needed to circumcise their male children. In other words, if you want to be a part of the covenant community, you have to take the sign and seal of the covenant, circumcision. And this is what Paul basically says. You are made a part of God's covenant community, not by physical circumcision, but by a spiritual circumcision in Christ. And the second thing that he says is in verse 12, he says, you're buried with him in baptism, wherein also you're risen with him through the faith. In other words, you're placed into the body of Christ by the spirit to walk in newness of life. And when he refers to baptism here, he's not referring to water baptism. He's actually referring to spirit baptism, where the person is identified with Christ, placed into the body of Christ at that moment that they're uh, saved, regenerated. A third Uh, answer to how we are complete in him is found in verse 13. He says, you've been regenerated by the power of God. He says, you being dead in your sins, the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him. In verse 13, he says, your sins have been forgiven. He says, he has forgiven you all your trespasses. In verse 14, he says that you've been freed from the condemnation of the law that stood against you. In fact, this is To me, one of the most impactful statements in the entire section. In verse 14, he says, He blotted out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us. And he took it out of the way and he nailed it to his cross. You know, it's interesting. He's talking to primarily Gentile Christians here. 
And he's basically saying that law stood against you in two ways. In one, you didn't fulfill the law. You didn't obey the law. And so you were under the condemnation of the law. You deserve God's wrath and God's judgment. And that law that stands against you, that condemns you, has been nailed to the cross and taken care of in full. But he's really emphasizing a second aspect to the, the law's uh, sting against the Gentile was that the law really separated between Jew and Gentile. And that distinction was seen more clearly in any other place than in the Old Testament law. And basically what he says is when Christ went to that cross and he hung on that cross and he died for our sins, that law was nailed to the cross with Christ. And you are now free from the condemnation and the sting of the law. What an incredible statement. In verse 15, also another tremendous statement. He says this, God has demonstrated his ultimate power and the defeat of Satan when he went to that cross. He says he has spoiled principalities and powers and made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. When I read this passage, my mind went back to Genesis chapter 3, where, where God basically tells Adam and Eve that he is going to crush the serpent's head through the seed of the woman. In fact, that's really the first time that the gospel is stated in any way in the scripture. Right after the fall, he says the seed of the woman is going to crush the serpent's head. And basically, we come to verse 15, where he has spoiled principalities and powers and made a show of them openly triumphing over them. And it, that is exactly what he was talking about in Genesis chapter 3. When Christ was nailed to that cross, and that handwriting of ordinances was nailed to that cross, and he dies for our sins, Basically, Satan's power is disarmed. And now we're in a position where God is demonstrating his triumph and his, uh, his, his victory over Satan. And so the cross and what God did on that cross in the Lord Jesus Christ uh, really demonstrates God's ultimate power over sin and Satan. And so when we talk about the reason that we are complete in him, he gives you a whole list of those things. We then go to a fourth observation. He addressed a series uh, of specific applications in light of, those appli in, in, in light of those truths. In other words, Paul is saying, look, there are two reasons why you need to not get lured and captured by these philosophies that are empty, that are vain, that ultimately are, are causing you to become captive. He said the first reason is because of who Christ is. In him dwells all the fullness of of the Godhead bodily. He said the second reason is that you're complete in him. And here's a list of all the ways that he has completed you, that he has filled you up. He then goes on to say this, well, based on those truths, this is how you apply it in the situations that you're dealing with right now. Here are specific ways that you are being captured and you need to resist those temptations. Here they are. First of all, don't let people shame you to go back under the Mosaic law. In verse 16, he says, let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of a holy day or of, of new moons or of Sabbath days. That statement is basically saying, look, the people that are trying to entice you and capture you to go back under the Mosaic law saying, you can't eat pork, you can't eat shellfish, you got to follow the Sabbath days. And we're not just talking about the Sabbath as we think of it, but really all of the Jewish feasts and festivals, you have to go back under that system in order to really be a Christian and really commune with God. He's saying, don't let people shame you into that form of thinking. That is people capturing you through philosophy and vain deceit. A second one that he mentions is this, don't let people belittle you by their endless conversations about private spiritual experiences that are either whipped up by their emotions or really just simply imagined. In verse 18, he says, let no man beguile you of your reward in a voluntary humility, worshiping of angels. And this is the phrase that's very interesting. Intruding into things which he hath not seen, vainly puffed up by his fleshly mind. In other words, he's saying people are telling you of experiences that they have enjoyed and they're basically belittling you and making you feel like you're a second rate person because you've not experienced these things. And he says they're actually 
imagining the very things they're telling you about. He's saying, so don't let people belittle you through these endless conversation of private spiritual experiences that they've whipped up in their emotions. A third thing that he mentions that's very important is this. Don't let people shame you into a life of unnecessary neglect of appropriate care for your body. In other words, there are people out there that are saying, look, the body is bad. So you need to make sure that you take your body and you you beat it and you don't enjoy fleshly desires. When he talks about fleshly desires here, he's not talking about sinful passions. He's saying there are people that are telling you not to do things that are appropriate cares of your body. Making sure that you sleep enough, <laughs> making sure that you eat appropriately, making sure that you exercise your body. And this is the way he puts it in, 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 in verse number 23. He says, these have indeed a show of wisdom, neglecting of the body, not in any honor to the satisfying of the flesh. He's basically saying, let, don't let people shame you into neglecting what is an appropriate care of your physical body. You know, it's interesting, during a, a major part of, of, of church history, there are people that believe the only way you are a truly spiritual person, if you're willing to be a monk who lived in a monastery or a nun who lived in a convent, where you were denying your fleshly desires. You weren't going to get married. You're going to live a life entirely dedicated to God. You would rise early. You would go to bed late. You would fast. You would pray. You would live a life of true devotion to God. And the truth is that that form of thinking is in complete contradiction to what Paul is telling these Christians. The truth is that God has given us richly all things to enjoy. And when we, when we enjoy what God has given us in the light of eternity, as good gifts as his hand, we bring tremendous glory and honor to the Lord in those things. So here's the question, observation number five. What was the main point? Well, the main reason Paul warned these Christians of these empty philosophies was not only because he knew that these philosophies would enslave the people, but here's the key. They replaced the only actual source of nourishment for the soul. In other words, Paul's saying it's not just that you're being lured and enticed. It's not just that you are being enslaved by these philosophies that don't come from God, that come from the imaginations of men. He says, but they are replacing the true source of spiritual vitality. That's the truths that we find in the gospel and in the person and work of Christ. In verse 19, he puts it this way, and they're not holding the head from which all the body by joints and bands, having nourishment ministered, and knit together increaseth when the increase of God. In other words, instead of them focusing on what will really grow them and what will mature them, what will nourish their soul, they've replaced the truth with a lie. They've become enslaved by this lie, and they're enslaving you by this lie. So folks, the question is this, how can we apply what we've learned? Let me just share with you a couple of things that I jotted down this morning that I hope will encourage you as you reflect on this passage. The first thing is this. I, we, need to recognize there's a difference between being spiritual in the sense that we have experienced something and being godly. Being godly means that the source of the change in us is the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit. The fact that we are new creatures in Christ, that old things have passed away and all things have become new, through God's word, he changes the way that we think. He changes our character. He changes our responses. He makes us more and more like the Lord Jesus Christ. There is a huge difference between godliness and having some mystical experience that really has no power to make us more like Christ. Second apl application, I need to run my own race, fo focused on the basics that I read about in Scripture. One of the things that Paul's basically saying, not that Paul's encouraging Christians to withdraw from other Christians and to, to live independent, autonomous lives where they don't come in contact with people. Paul isn't saying that at all. Paul believes in the local church. But Paul's saying this, don't let people's experiences dominate you that, in such a way that they distract you from what is right in front of your face. You know, what the Bible says, it's there for you to read. It's there for you to study. I can dig into the text of Scripture. I can be nourished and strengthened. I don't need to feel compelled to try to follow the philosophies of people around me who may actually be making up the very things that they're sharing with me. Three, I need to guard my heart 
against philosophical replacements to a Christ-centered life. And you know, there are so many ways that there are positions, views that can crowd out and replace what we have in Christ. We need to be cautious of those things. And I need to reflect daily on the blessings that are secured for me in Christ. You know, as I think about the passage, the thing that really stands out to me is, why would you replace what is true, what is impactful, what nourishes your soul with something that came up that, that really found its source in a man's mind? And the Apostle Paul is, is, is just pressing that on our souls. We need to reflect deeply on the blessings that we have in Christ. Let's just bow together for a word of prayer and thank God for the time we've spent together. Father, it has been a wonderful time of reflection as we think about the text in front of us. I pray that every person who has the opportunity to listen to this, uh, this encouragement from your word would be blessed by it. I pray that we would think deeply about the gospel, that uh, our hearts would not be captured by philosophy and vain deceit, but that we would find our strength and our stability and the nourishment of our soul in Christ and the gospel. We ask for your blessing on each person that has the opportunity to hear this today, and we ask it in Christ's name. Amen. Well, thank you so much for joining us. I hope that you have uh, a wonderful morning, and I know it's raining a little bit here in Maryland, but it's going to be a wonderful day, and I'm thankful for the opportunity to get to see you this morning. Bye now.